that's the story. And hey, that's Sheila. 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 No man, I didn't gonna be. Gula Mola Show. Gila Mara Tona Tola Sheila. Hey, hey, hey. Inside you, there is a great kingdom. Surrounding that kingdom, there are snowy-tipped mountains. Underneath those mountains, there are blue-green forests. Underneath those blue-green forests, there are meadows of wild flowers erupting from the dark earth like cups of honey. In a place like that, you could hunt for a thousand years with your hawk and your horse and your hound and never dint the wild harvest. A woman could come to the edge of a lock and sing in the old way and the twelve-tined stag would cross that lock just to be in the presence of her rice smile. All of this is going on inside us all of the time. And that is why it is so hard to meditate. And in the very center of this kingdom, there was a king and there was a queen. First bit of good news. I can tell you they were not little Herods squashing the life here and there. They were rivers to their people rivers. Everybody had met the king and the queen. And I'm not just talking about the people, I'm talking about the badgers, I'm talking about the adders, I'm talking about irritable squirrels. Everybody had a story. Everybody had had a little selfie with the king and the queen. I promise. They were loved. They had crossed, they had been to every traveller's camp. They'd been to every tavern. They'd been to every desolate beach. They'd been to every crossroads place. Everyone knew it. What people were not so clear about was that at night, when the king and queen went back to their chamber, there was a grief that hang or hung heavy between them. And the grief was this. They could not conceive a child. They had tried. They had brought in all the people that understood the magic of the hedgerows. They tried again. Nothing. And it had become such a grief between them that a grief like that, over time, will move out over the land. The land was starting to ail. They say the barley was starting to dip in the field. The great silvery streams of Dartmoor were nothing but little muddy tracks. The salmon would lie with her eggs rancid in her belly in the dirt. It was getting serious. Now, after a time, because this was a complete secret, you can be sure everybody knew about it. You know what secrets are like. And so a well-meaning relative went to the king and the queen and said, look, we know there's a downstairs mix-up with the queen. We know there's something that's not quite right. But how could it... Look, you have so many nieces and nephews... Why don't you bring one of them into the castle so at the very least you have that wonderful sound of a little kitty running up and down the corridor causing trouble? One of the great sounds. And they said, indeed, indeed, indeed. Bring one. Now the thing that they coveted more than anything else was the notion of a baby daughter. Having one myself, I can understand why. So this little girl was brought to the castle. She had one of those access all area. You know those little passes you get at rock festivals? She had one. There was nowhere was off bounds for this little kid. 
She could go down to where they were cooking the food. She could go even further down to the wine cellars. She could go out into the garden. She could go even go to the sounding halls where the poets compose from the scarred valleys of language. So she's quite eloquent. But this is what the little girl loved more than anything else. She liked to wander through the garden. Now, the gardens are very trimmed. They're very elegant. They're very just so. But at the edge of the garden is the beginning of an enormous old growth forest. Now, she'd been given a golden ball as a gift from the king and the queen. You were given a golden ball when you were born. And she would take this ball down and she'd just play with it on the edge between the garden and the wild. Her favourite time of day to play was what we down here call the dimpsy time, dusk time. If you were French, you might call it the time between dog and wolf. So she's down there playing with her ball. A mist has settled. Owls screech from wet black branches and something astonishing happens. Stepping out from behind one of these old great oaks is another little girl. This one is a whole other picture. She's not a little princess in waiting. She is like a kind of squashed flamenco dancer. <laughs> Ba-bang! ding 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 there she is. Her little chin, her little chin is jutting up. Her hair is a crow's nest pirouetting down her back. And she, uh, she has feet and she speaks a little bit like Coyote. I like a de ball. <laughs> I like a de ball. How much for de ball? She's a bit mafia, actually, a bit godfather. <laughs> How much for de ball? Now, this is a genius moment, a great image for our souls because the girl in the trimmed garden took a deep breath and she threw the golden ball to the wild girl. Girl catches it, examines it, thinks about its financial value, <laughs> but throws it back. And for half an hour, more or less, it seems so great their happiness that they could move the ball back and forth. It was like the sighing of the tides. It was like a needle going in and out between this world and that world. It's called quilting yourself to the other world. That is what is happening at that moment. Now, back at the castle, king and queen are sitting on the thrones. They're thinking about how badly everything is going when suddenly the young girl runs in. She says, I got news, I got news, I got news, it's going to blow your mind. <laughs> and I said, well, what? I said, I've just been down at the very edge of the garden where the great wood is where I'm not really meant to go because I love the tang of danger. And I was there playing with my golden ball and this wild girl came out. Now, she has a grandmother, a strange looking woman. But apparently she understands something called fertility magic. She understands the movement of the moon. In fact, she doesn't even call it the moon. She calls it the yellow breast of the moon. That's much better, much better. She says she can sort out whatever's going on. You can have a bun in the oven, job done. I said, well, how many people know about our little, our little situation? And she said, oh, oh no, but do you want to see her? And they said, she said well, of course, bring her in, bring her in. <laughs> So, as dusk is settling, in comes the old woman with the young girl, the little squashed flamenco dancer. Now, this old woman, I've got to tell you, her language is very strange. Some say her voice was like rooster blood dragged from the heart of the moon. What the hell does that sound like? <laughs> others say, others say her voice was like words gathered from underneath a stone. Now, the old magician did the first thing that all old magicians absolutely have to do. You have to deny 
that you are an old magician. Job description number one. So she comes in and she says, I don't know. This is my, my little granddaughter. She's just a bambino. She's just a storyteller. I can't help you with these things. This is way beyond me. I'm just a simple old lady from the forest. I'm, I'm turning. I'm leaving. I am going. I am quite dramatically. I am leaving. I am leaving. <laughs> the little girl is saying, Brandy! Offer her some brandy, you idiots! And the queen says, husband, have you got any brandy? And he says, well, I've, I, I have the special bottle, the special <laughs> bottle that was given to me by uh, Leonard Cohen. My Leonard, my Leonard Cohen brandy bottle. She says, now's the time! Wait, 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 come back, please. Would you like some of Leonard Cohen's brandy? And she said, uh, suddenly producing a her yard of ale. And she said, just a little bit at the bottom. More than that. A little bit more. What are you? Do you not understand generosity? More of it. Drinks the brandy. Oh, settles. You know what it's like going, and then, but then, I am leaving, I am leaving, I am going, I am leaving. Wait, cigars, cigars! And he says, wife, this is your department, cigars. What are your cigars? She says, I only have the cigars that Joni Mitchell gave me. I don't want to give them away. <laughs> Now's the time! Would you like some of Joni Mitchell's cigars? And she said, well, did give her such a wonderful singing voice. So now, now, oh, the old lady, whew, she's got a few moves going. She's enjoying herself, she's smoking, she's drinking, there's a few little party lights. <laughs> she could stay forever. But they kind of get to the choice and they, they say, look, 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 we have got this issue. Do you have any advice for us? And she says, yes. And she points with one long bony finger out of the window up to this very, 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 very tall tower. And she says, Am I right in thinking in the way that old wild women think that up there in the tower, that is where your bedroom is? And they said, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> and she said, <laughs> this problem is going to be easier to fix than I thought. Woman, the very eggs in your belly will get dizzy that high from the soil. <laughs> and as for the man, now, I have to choose my words carefully here because I'm in the presence of a few strangers. As for the man, your, your purling will be as a grey sludge as long as you're up at the top of that tower, <laughs> if you catch my drift. You are too high off the ground. Nothing fertile can come that far away from the earth. But I have a plan, a cunning plan, she said. Tonight! Tonight, Queenie, you are to have a bath. I will not be able to keep the thoughts up. You are to have a bath. <laughs> and in that bath, it's to be the kind of bath you only have once or twice a year. You are to open a bottle of wine. You are to put herbs in the bath. And because we've mentioned her once already, you shall play some Joni Mitchell while you're in the bath. <laughs> but only Court and Spark or Blue. None of her difficult jazz albums, none. <laughs> they never happened. For the intentions of this story, there were no difficult jazz albums from Johnny Mitchell. <laughs> Pull me back, look into my eyes, not around the eyes, look into the eyes. Look into the eyes. And you're under. So, this is what's going to happen. Have the bath. Get your servants to carry the water down the steps, through the ballrooms, out into the garden, to the furthest stable where the floor is nothing but dark soil. And pour the water into it. Let it soak in your dirty bath water. Then bring down the great golden bread, plonk it over the top and call your husband. Make sure he is flossed. Make sure he is in his most spectacular royal pyjamas and set him to work. All night long, relentlessly, <laughs> till dawn breaks. Then, as you lie in the, uh, the radiant contentment of each other's deep mysteries, pull the bed aside and you shall find there are two flowers. One is red and one is white. Now, says the old woman, very, very important. You are to eat 
the white flower. That flower, it's organic. <laughs> it was procured from the gardens here at Schumacher. Its chakras have been perfectly balanced. <laughs> it's never had a lustful thought in its life. If you consume that flower, you will live a long, long, long life. And you will conceive a child for the boot. But the red flower. Oh, God. Whatever you do, don't eat the red flower. That flower, that is the barbecue of the flower world. It is calorific. It is boozy. It smells of the scent of something called Lagavulin, if you get anywhere near it. It is the Johnny Cash of the flower world. <laughs> Only bad things can happen if you consume the red flower. So you've got the message. You will consume the white flower. She said, yes, of course I will. I'm not an idiot. What could possibly go wrong? And the <laughs> old woman said, <laughs> did anybody read you fairy tales as a child? <laughs> well, with that... They cantered out on the dark horses of their prides. The two, little girl, little squash flamenco, and the old woman, and they were gone. Well, immediately, proceedings began. The bath water was run. Record player was on. Wine was drunk. And the bath water was indeed carried down to the furthest stable and poured into the dark soil. The uh, golden bed was brought across it. The husband was summoned. He was a little nervous. <laughs> well, it's high pressure gig, you know. The stakes are high. It's like a rabbit caught in the headlights. But anyway, that is another story. The dawn comes, the bed is pushed aside, and just as the old woman said, there is a white flower and there is a red flower. Well, she remembered the instructions perfectly clearly. She pushed her husband aside, and with her great hand, slim and elegant, she moved down to consume the white flower, just like you did. Why do we do it? <laughs> Why do we do it? Blake says, you will do things with your hands that your body will later have to testify against you for. <laughs> and she reached down with her hand to eat the white flower. She was going to be very delicate. It was going to be a wonderful moment. She was going to lift it up to the, to, the, to the moist cave of her mouth and consume it. And suddenly she's on all fours and she's eating the red flower. And she's going, I'm so alive, I'm so alive. Oh my God, I've never felt so alive. <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Shit! Shit! <laughs> the husband has seen this kind of thing before. <laughs> and so when she points to him, she says, You shall tell no one of what has transpired in the hut today! <laughs> And, and all husbands and suitors, listen to this, <laughs> he never did. But he did have a suggestion. He said, well, my love, you know. Oh, look, the white flower's still there. Just eat the white flower. We'll forget about the red. It was a night of madness. Eat the white flower. We'll go on a, a cleanse, a juice cleanse. We'll get, <laughs> we'll, we'll get it out. We'll do raw food for a couple of weeks. Maybe a vision quest. Who knows? <laughs> we'll forget all about the white flower, the red flower. Well, she consumed it, and of course, in a second, in the way that women know, she knew something was changing, and she was indeed pregnant. Nine months pass, and she is in that most extraordinary of rituals pushing a baby through the realm of the ambiotic, from the realm of her belly out into this one. Surrounding her are various relatives, various aunts, 
various midwives and the oldest doula they could find. Now this doula, you know, is, you know you've got relatives who as they get older, they seem to get a bit smaller. You ever notice the old shrinking going on? This doula is so old, they produce her from a matchbox every now and then because she can see into things that are denied other people. She can see to the heart of the matter. So maybe she's not, maybe she's not matchbox size, but she's not much bigger. And she's down there and she's peering into the scrying bowl of the woman's vagina. That's an ad lib, but you can take it. The scrying bowl of her vagina. And she's saying, ooh, yes. Something is coming down the chute. Something is, oh, oh Lord, oh no. Everybody get back. I didn't see this in the runes. Everybody get back because suddenly bursting from between the woman's legs is a little goat. And on the back of the goat, there is a little baby girl wrapped it totally in hair with a tattered hood over her face going, meat, 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 waving a spoon. And everybody went, ow! <laughs> and holding her spoon in the air, Tatterhood, because that is her name, said, be cool. <laughs> Just be cool. And they were cool. To all of the four directions, they were definitely cool. Because she said, it's the twins. Twins are coming. The one you want to see, she's coming down at the chute. <laughs> Forget about me, just bring me some barbecue. <laughs> and so they went off to get her some jerk chicken. They went off to get her some hay. They got a little bottle of something special. And a strange little being called Tatterhood, which I will remind you, is a little baby girl covered in hair on the back of a goat, waving a spoon saying, meat, meat, meat. That energy, that shameless, because if you're in the business of Tata, she is unutterably without shame. She's in the corner, waving the spoon. Seconds later, out pops the baby everybody was hoping for. She is sweet, she's got the hands, she's got the fingers, she can sing, she can dance, she can tap. You know, she just comes out and she's just great. She's a gorgeous little girl, the fair sister. Now, this is the moment in the story where you realize we're in the presence of something very, very ancient. This is when the story drops into an almost paleolithic world. The two girls were never separated. Now, it is an old Gnostic secret that on the night you were born, you had a twin. And the twin was taken and thrown out of the window into the forest. And it is the business it is the trouble of an adult life to find the wild twin that culture at large tells you does not exist. But this story is older than that. Couldn't part the girls. I mean, I'm not going to lie, they tried. They would put Tatterhood in far distant attics like a crazy old aunt but they'd hear her laughing through the wall and it sounded like she was having such a good time before everybody's joining Tatterhood. The sister certainly is. And so they had a very complete childhood. Until... that strange river that separates adolescence from young womanhood or young manhood. Now... It is Christmas Eve, and the fair sister is having a ball. This is the night that she is introduced to polite society. All the potential suitors for a hundred miles have turned up. All the squires are there. All the, uh, the young guys full of, you know, piss and vinegar. They're all downstairs waiting to meet the fair, the fair sister. Now, Dad is upstairs polishing his great sword, thinking about those young men downstairs. <laughs> I, I deeply identify with this scene. He's with his sword and he's saying, there's no one good enough for my girl. There's no one good enough for her. Wow. That's how he sang. That's how they all sing over there. Wow. 
So he's doing that. Now, while he is up there doing this and coming out rather like a sort of a mannequin puppet is the fair daughter. Tatterhood is coming down with her and she's, oh, you know, she's just, uh, she's a beautiful, righteous mess. But something is happening outside the castle. For 60 miles all around, Every dryad, every naiad, every giant, every ogre, every strange being is pouring down from the forests and the glens and the hills and they are bashing great greasy leather drums and they're going... And they're making their slow way towards this castle. Most of us at adolescence had something like this coming towards us. So soon... They have surrounded the polite castle. Now the king saying, well, you know, um, warriors I can handle, but I, I've never seen anything as supernatural as this. I, I, I fear I'm a little out of my league. <laughs> Tatterhood, however, peered down on the assembled masses. It was like a, a convention of goths. Do you know what goths are? <laughs> but Whitby, lots of strange black capes and horns and tusks and things and people with huge breasts like tating deadly nightshade it was that kind of scene <laughs> she said hey these are my people these are my people i think i'm going to go down and i'm going to sort this out for you sister come with me this is a great moment and she took her sister to the window they're all out there <laughs> <laughs> and tatterhood raised her spoon and she said sister you see this? You see how outgunned we are? You see that there's no way back. You see that I cannot possibly survive if I go out into that field. This is my Bonnie and Clyde moment. This is my Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You know I'm going to die if I go out there. And she says, yeah. And Tato says, well, I'm going to do it. And when I'm going to do it, I'm going to give you some language to remember. Because the next time you're in trouble, a young woman needs in her quiver ferocious, ribald, fearless language to hurl out at this world. Do you want to hear some of the language of Tatterhood at that moment? Yes. Yeah. Tatterhood said this, and please repeat this first bit after me if you've ever had an issue with self-esteem. <laughs> if my life be short, let my fame be great. If my life be short, let my fame be great. Let herds of bears surround me. Let herds of bears surround me. Good, now I'll carry on. I shall place my hand into the mouth of the wolf, and I shall not count the cost. My spoon shall be a rain dagger from the hills of Ceredigion. She suddenly become Welsh. <laughs> I suck on the pap of life, and I shall be a hard butcher to anyone that tries to pull me from it. Did you get that, sister? She says, yeah, that's my wild sister. And with that, and with a frankly crazed look in her eyes, Tatterhood took to the field, outnumbered, outgunned, she didn't care. She flailed here with her spoon. She flailed there with her spoon. Up and down it went like a combine harvester. And before too long, people were saying, I didn't know it was going to turn out like this. And they were turning and they were fleeing the field with her behind them. Well, Watching from the castle, as you would, bearing in mind this is the most exciting thing to happen for about 10,000 years, <laughs> peering out of the walls is her sister. And it just happens that the last witch to leave the field with one bony hand reached out, pulled the head off the young sister, put a calf on it and ran off with the head of the fair sister. <laughs> That was a very swift move, so I'm going to slow it down and explain it again. <laughs> As the last witch left the field, she turned. The fair sister's head was sticking out of the window. She grabbed the head. She pulled it off. It happened that there was a calf walking past. She pulled off the head of the calf. She put it on the head of the sister. 
What is the sound of a young confused calf, please? Very good. You can tell this is a rural audience. I tried this in London. Nothing. 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 So, there you go. So the king and the queen, who one moment were expecting to introduce their daughter to polite society, the fair daughter now has the head of an animal. And they're going, oh, oh. Crikey, well, you know. Tatterhood, is, is there any way you can get us out of this mess? Tatterhood said this. She is safer with the head of a calf than what you were about to do to her. She's safer with the head of a calf than what you were about to do. But it does happen that I do know where the, uh, where the woman has gone that's stolen the head of your daughter. There is a crazy old hut two lakes away where all these women gather and they do nutty things together. They do nutty things. You know, women do nutty things together. It's marvellous. They do strange rituals that we can only guess at. They play card games. They tell dirty jokes that only they understand. And behind them is a nail hanging out of the wall. And they have taken the young girl's head and they have stuck it on the nail and she is having to inhale all their cigar smoke. They throw brandy at her three times a day and they tell all the 10,000 secrets a woman needs before she enters a hut with a man. We should be so lucky to be on that nail. That is what you call an initiatory image. So, well, this is very good, says the king. I shall provide professional witch catchers and mercenaries and my men and we shall go and get them. No, said Tatterhood. This is an issue for me and my calf daughter. Just lend us a boat. We shall cross the locks and we will get her head back. So, that is what transpired. They go over the first lock. They go over the second lock. And up ahead is the hut. Now, do you remember the image I gave you half an hour ago about the car at the park? B -b -b -b. It's even worse. It's crazier. It's that, but with mad fiddle playing over the top. <laughs> Vanessa May's in there somewhere on drugs. <laughs> so, she says, look, be cool. I will go in and get your head back. You know what it's like when you have to go in a part, into a party and get someone's coat when they've been sick outside? That's just a, it's a bit like that. I'll go in and get your coats. You just stay in the car. You've done enough. You've done enough. So she goes in and she flails with her spoon this way and that way. And indeed, she drags back off that rusty nail the startled head of her uh, sister with three three silver hairs in it, as I recall, that weren't there before. And as they got back to the boat, it just happens that there was a calf walking by with no head. And so she pulled the calf head off the sister, put it on the head of the calf, put her head back on her head, and they were done. Hmm. I'm not going to lie. The fair sister was a little bit discombobulated. <laughs> Just a tad. And those three strands of silver, I mean, she has seen some funky ass stuff in the hut. I mean, we can't talk about what she saw in the hut. It's the hut of the many secrets. But we have reached what you could call a crossroads moment in the story. Now, Tatterhood said, this is the way it could go. We could get back on the boat and I will take you all the way back safely to uh, the life you had before. Or we could take the boat, you with the strands of silver in your hair, me with my tattered hood, and we could wander the world looking for stories to claim us. Now, I don't often drop academic language into a room but I want to at this moment, so lean forward, please. <laughs> if Mercia Eliada was here now, if Marie-Louise von Franz was here now, she would tell you in her severe tone of voice that this is what is called a Thelma and Louise <laughs> moment. <laughs> <laughs> ba boom 
And of course, I am pleased to relate. They said, ah, we're not going home. We're not going to go home. We're going to become little hell's angels on a boat. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And so they set off. Were I to tell you everything that happened to the two women on the boat, we would be here till Christmas Eve. So I won't. What I will tell you is just a few of the legends that hang, hang off their shoulders. People claim and claim truly they spent three years on the top of Yggdrasil, the world tree herself, nesting with a great condor. Some claim that as their boat traveled, gathering stories here and there, stories they could not know, landed on the deck, tundra snow and jaguar teeth. And over time, the two girls learnt a strange antlered language. And that became how they carried stories. And they are always heading north, and they are always heading north, and they are always heading north, until they came to the final kingdom. They are famous now. When you get to the port where the two girls are, it is Beatlemania. Do you remember those, you know, people have got like little, they've all got little tatter hoods now. It's daddy, it's coming, daddy, it's coming. <laughs> they all run out and they just go here and there. Now. This kingdom in the far north, there was a king and he was in that difficult position of there being no queen. He was a widow. He just had a young son. Now, the moment the king, who had gone straight down to the port to watch the two girls arrive, the moment he laid eyes on the woman with the three strands of silver in her hair, he fell un utterably, inexorably, and forever in love with her. Je t'aime, je t'aime, je t'aime. Blimey, he said. <laughs> Have I told you about his son? Yeah. Have I? I've told you about the son of the king? I haven't told you about the son of the king. The son of the king, about 17, 18, he was so good looking. He looked... You're not even going to believe this is possible. We're going to scatter it into the room tonight. He was a mixture of Jim Morrison <laughs> and Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. Take it in. <laughs> I give it to you. I just give it away. I give it away. Take it. Do with it what you just have to do. Just take the image. Take it. Get it away from me. I don't feel well. He was, he was, he was so beautiful, even I'm confused. <laughs> Even I'm feeling all tingly and most peculiar. <laughs> and, get this, he doesn't say much, which is brilliant because that means he must be complicated. <laughs> so he looks like a mixture of Aragorn and Jim Morrison. He's not saying much. You're filling in in your imagination everything you think he's thinking. He's really thinking about, you know, one banana, two banana, <laughs> but you know, you're like, he's working on his novel. One day, high hopes. So we've got the sun. Everywhere he goes, there's music from the doors playing. So he's wearing leather trousers, and they work with him. They not work for many of us, but they work for him. So look, they, whew, they settle him. They settle him. Class, please. They settle him, and the king is building up every day. He's walking around in circles because he's thinking, Sooner or later, I'm going to have to tell the woman with the three str strands of silver in her hair that I am like woefully thunderstruck, lightning struck in love with her. Oh, God, oh God, how am I going to do this? So he goes to Tatterhood to negotiate. And he says, look, I knew love when I was young and I loved my wife and I've mourned her and everyone in this kingdom has seen the tears pour like hard rain down onto the ground. And I never thought that my heart could be anything but a lump of coal again. But I love your sister. I love her. I love her. She is a hot moon gazing on water. She is singing an old tune I've waited my whole life to hear. 
And surely curly heaven lives between those hips. Tatterhood said, what? <laughs> it was all going so well until that last little phrase. <laughs> what do you mean curly heaven lives between those hips? And anyway, where we come from, older sisters marry fast! <laughs> Ooh, I see. So, so you're old. She says, yeah, by at least 30 seconds. And I've got a lot of love to give. <laughs> he said, OK. OK, well, let's, let's think about this. There's got to be a shepherd boy. There must be somebody that works with pigs or something, some, f some rustic that you could have a, a tryst with. And she said, how very dare you. I'm talking the full thing. I'm talking marriage, the marital bed, to be married in public. Ah. And he said, OK, OK, OK. Well, well, is there someone you have your eye on? And she said, yes, as a matter of fact, there is. <laughs> he looks a little like Jim Morrison. <laughs> but he's also like somebody called Aragorn from Lord of the Rings who hasn't happened yet, but I can see into the future, so I know. <laughs> I like him because he has a young man's face, but an old man's courtesy. A young man's face and an old man's courtesy. I want to marry your son. If he marries me, you can marry my sister. <laughs> so go and see what he thinks. <laughs> so, father and son, they take the long walk. <laughs> Son, have I really ever asked anything of you before? <laughs> like, like, real, real stuff. No more. Devon, why has he become Devon? No more, Dad. No, no, fun. <laughs> no, you have not. No, we're be at two. Oh, I don't know. No, no, you, you've been lovely. Lovely. You're, you're a good man. You're a good man. I like you. I admire you, Father. I admire you. He says, <laughs> good. Good, because today all the crows land at once on your little roof. And he tells his son the whole situation. Now, his son gave a response that you could find naive, charming, or deeply moving. Take your pick. But his son, who, as we know, rarely spoke. He said, Father, I was there with my arm round your shoulders as you wept to the core of your being over my mother's grave. We all know how much you loved her. And to see this flowering in your heart, to see that just for a moment, all the grief that is in it has moved away on the nine oceans and all the joy come in, I will marry her. Father, I would go to the gates of hell for you. <laughs> Bring it on. It was a strange experience for the father. Very strange. Grief and joy in either hand. <coughs> so the wedding is prepared. It was not a large wedding, which is unfortunate if you're a storyteller because you like to spend hours describing the weddings. But what I can tell you, it was a small chapel. But on the way to the wedding, Leading the procession, of course, is the king and the woman with the three strands of silver in her hair. Behind them is the young prince, and next to him, on her goat, is Tattered Hood. And they were trotting along, and she said, The trouble with me! He said, we're, we're not even married yet. <laughs> she said, the trouble with men is that you have forgotten the questions that open a woman's soul. So, as my dowry to you, I am going to give you the questions you need to ask me to open my soul, we should be so lucky. Enormous generosity. He said, I have registered that that is a good idea. 
So she said, why is it that I am riding on the back of a goat? And he said, yes, 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 yes. Well, why is it you're riding the back of a goat? Because for one with eyes to behold it, it is not a goat at all. It is a Castilian steed. Boom! Suddenly underneath her was a majestic horse, broad shoulders, long tail, steam from its nostrils, eyes a thousand years old, black saddle, black bridle. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Ready for the next question, my love? And he said, yes, I am. Yes. Why is it that I'm always waving this spoon about? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that is, that is kind of odd. <laughs> Why is it you are waving your spoon? And she said, because for one with eyes to see it, to behold it, it is not a spoon at all. It is a wand. And suddenly there was no spoon, but a long stem of rowan with a tip of antler bone on the end. I like the way this is turning out. <laughs> and finally, finally, why is it I have lived my whole life with a tattered hood covering half my face? And he said, why is it? She said, because for one with eyes to see it, it is not a tattered hood at all. It is a crown. It's a crown. And at that moment, there was no hood anymore, but a crown of wildflowers and a torrent of hair down her back, and the young man was seeing a woman he was going to love his whole life. It's just that simple sometimes, if we can just behold it. So, they caught up with the rest of the wedding party. Now, do you remember the little matchbox doula? You remember her, don't you? Of course you do. Well, I'm pleased to report she had another function as well as one of the first female priests in the area. So she was waiting in her little matchbox to bring the two lovers together. And even more wonderfully, they had a little priest in the area who was also very old and he was brought forward in a matchbox too. And the two matchbox were opened and the two little people looked out at each other and went, ooh, 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 ooh. Maybe it's going to be a marriage for three couples. <laughs> but all I can tell you is that day of days in the kingdom to the far north. The king did indeed marry the woman with the three strands of silver in her hair. The young man did indeed marry Tattered Hood. But that night, on the dance floor of the wedding, as Tattered Hood led the procession under those lights i cannot swear that when the mood took her you didn't just for a second see a goat i can't absolutely promise you that sometimes when sufficiently irritated the spoon would shoot out through the half light and whack you around the head <laughs> watching this whole strange procession was an owl. And that owl flew to the four quarters and told the story everywhere it could be of the two sisters carrying stories and their strange antlered language. Until an old Sicilian woman told the story to me, and I find myself here, 
have no idea what the night is. Is it Wednesday? On a Wednesday night, telling the story to you. And remember, this is going on inside you all the time. So only you know what happened next. Because that's how it was. That's how it happened. And that is all.